Ephesians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Oh, I got to stop right there. He was an apostle. He said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by what? The will of God. You know, he didn't choose. He didn't choose Jesus. The thing, interesting thing about Paul is he didn't choose Jesus. He was on the road to Damascus one day going to kill and persecute Christians. And you know what happened? Jesus met him. He had an encounter with Christ. And see, some of us were just like that. Some of us never intended. When we were in the world, we, we were just walking by the way of the world, the system, everything that was within us. We just said, we're going to do for ourselves. But somebody gave us an encounter with Jesus. And it could be nobody else but Jesus himself. And Jesus encountered you. The same way that he encountered the apostle Paul, Jesus encountered you. And you know, the interesting thing about the word apostle is that the word apostle means called out, uh, called out from. Call, you're a called out one. You, you know, so, the, so you're an apostle in a sense of you've been called out of the world. You've been called out of the world into Christ. Let me say in Christ. Into Christ. Amen. See, Paul had no intention of becoming an apostle. He had no intention of becoming this preacher, this teacher, this, this prophet to anybody. As a matter of fact, he was on his way to kill Christians. He was a murderer. The Bible declares that he said of himself, I am the chief of sinners. Amen. See, I don't care where you came out of. I don't care if you were in a jail cell. I don't care if you were if you were in, in society and you were in the upper echelon, amen. You you were uh you know you were uh, what we would call them you know back in the day the goody goody, amen. You were you were just kind of like you had a, a job, you had kids, you had a career, you had a, a, a decent family, but the Lord says you were still on your way to hell. Until one day he encountered you. One day you were on your road to Damascus. One day you were going about your everyday business and he encountered you. You didn't find Christ. Christ found you. Somebody here, you, you, you act like, oh, I came out of this whole uh, mindset. I came out of this, you know, I was out, I was out down, tall from the floor, feet up from the feet up. And I was on my way. And I, I out of, out of my, out of my uh, messed up mindset, my messed up life, I chose Jesus. I chose Jesus. Like he was, he was a choice. But the Bible declares that you were chosen before the foundation of the earth. He knew your choice. He knew that you were going to come to him. And he gave you everything that you needed for you to have an encounter with him. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, it doesn't say by the will of Paul, it doesn't say by the will of, of word of faith, by the will of Rhema, by the will of the, the, the universal church. Nobody will be for you to come into Christ. See, I know a lot of people, man, and it blows me away. A lot of people that I know, you know, they come from denominations and they come from, you know, these uh, these schools and, and they come, you know, I went to school, so I'm, you know, I'm talking about myself even. But they come from Bible colleges and Bible schools, and they come from, you know, they got more degrees than a thermometer, amen? But see, the reality is, is that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how much you read the Bible. It doesn't matter how much you pray, because I know, I know Muslims, and I know Catholics that pray more than Christians. I, I know, I know more devotion from people that are not even, that don't even know Christ, yet they have this moral, um, they have this moral responsibility towards what they believe is God. But it's funny how Christians, we come to God, and, and when you compare Christians to other faiths, it's like, man, Christians don't got the, they don't got the nearest clue on what a total commitment to Christ is. You know? Because you can't bring in your morality into the kingdom. You, you can't bring in your education into the kingdom. You can't even, you can't, I used to say this all the time, you cannot bring in, you can't ride your parents' coattails or someone's coattails into the kingdom. It doesn't work like that. But the Bible declares you have to come into the kingdom as a child. And Jesus made sure that he knew this. Because when you come into the kingdom, you, you, you don't know anything, amen? You, you come into the kingdom just ready to receive. You come in, 
into the kingdom. And the interesting thing is that when you come into the kingdom, all of a sudden you find a different, there's this different dynamic, a paradigm shift. Now, now Jesus says, if you don't want to go up, you better go down, right? Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Now there's this paradigm shift that takes place. And now, if you want to receive, you got to do what? Give. You got to give and you shall receive. Backwards from the world, right? Backwards. But see, we've come into this kingdom as little children. So I don't know about you, man, but I'm here not by my will. I'm here not by my morality. I'm here not even by what I know. I got to get, 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 get to give and give. No, that's backwards. That's the world system. Amen. Now I walk into God by the will of God. And, and so the Bible keeps going here. It says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Do you know that when you are faithful in Christ, he will always give you something. This letter came from a man who was, he was an apostle, he was chosen. This letter came from an individual who was, who was um, he didn't have no concept, really, of what he was bringing with this letter. But he knew that God was delivering this letter. See, I know a little bit about delivering letters. See, this letter was to the faithful. But see, I know a little bit about delivering letters. I used to be a mailman. I worked for the post office for 13 years. Amen? So I know a little bit about delivering letters. And one thing about delivering letters is sometimes when I delivered that letter, guess what? I didn't know who it was going to. Most of the time, I didn't know what it, what it, who it was going to. Secondly, I just knew the name, but I, I didn't know the individual. Secondly, I didn't know what was inside that letter. I had no clue. And sometimes the letter wasn't received, right? It would say return to sender. Or it would say nobody lives here by that name. Unknown, that's what we call it. Nobody lives here by that name. And see, it's the same thing when it comes to the word of God. Are you a receiving individual? Because God always has every single word that he gives, it always says to, to you, to those who are faithful. Now, when, when you take the word faithful, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean coming to church and serving. That's part of faithfulness. But faithfulness, faithfulness is having this heart of, of receiving and posturing your heart in a place, amen? Uh, 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 of, of faithfulness. How many of us have our hearts postured in a place of faithfulness? Amen. Amen. And see, same thing with my wife. My wife has her heart postured to be faithful. I have my, my heart postured to be faithful towards my wife. Because faithfulness is not something that you do. Faithfulness is something that you are. And so Paul's writing this letter, and he's saying, I'm delivering this letter from God. The return address is from God, but it says to the saints. That's why we read it towards you today. That's why I can open up this Bible, and I can read this epistle, which means letter. I can read you this epistle, and I can say to you, because you are a saint. You are a saint who are in Ephesus, but you are a saint who is in San Francisco. But he would be writing his letter to the saints at Ephesus, but the saints knew at Ephesus that this particular letter has so many spiritual truths that it was actually to everybody. Everybody that was faithful in Christ Jesus. Listen to that word again, in Christ, of Christ. You're going to find a lot of things in, in chapter 1, in Christ, of Christ. These are in Christ realities. Like you can't get none of this stuff if you're outside of Christ, right? You can't get it. You have to be in Christ. And I, I love Pastor David because oftentimes when, when he, I talk to him, 
And oftentimes when he preaches, he's very consistent in preaching in Christ realities. In Christ realities, a lot of preachers, man, they preach, you know, uh, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. They preach 10 steps to being successful. They preach inspirational messages. They preach things that like, you know, to how to, how to be uh, the better you. Matter of fact, there's this book that says Becoming the Better You. How about becoming the better you in Christ? Amen. Amen. How about 10 steps to, to understanding what it means to be in Christ? And see, that's what I love about Pastor David is he's always faithful. You guys got good, good teaching, solid teaching, good meat. Other churches, man, they get milk. How many of y'all know what happens to milk? It gets sour. Yeah, it gets sour. It gets a little, you know, look. You can preserve, you can try to do something with milk and turn it into cheese. But what happens to cheese? It gets moldy. But when you take meat, right? You take meat. Now, if meat is left alone, it'll do what? <laughs> it'll rot. Amen? It'll rot. But you know what happens when you apply salt to the meat? The Bible says you're the salt of the earth. So when you apply salt to the meat, oh my goodness, there's per there's preservation. Amen. There's still nutrition within that meat. I walk down the Costco's aisle and I'm like, man. How do they do this? This Chinese sausage, I literally always tell my wife, wow, look at that Chinese sausage. It's literally like not even in the freezer. It's not in the fridge, but it's just sitting out there on, 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 you know, on the shelf, and it's meat. It's sausage, but it's preserved in salt. I go to the Italian deli, and I'm like, wait a minute. What, what, what is that salami? It's not, it's not refrigerated. It's not frozen. It's just sitting there hanging, and, and you know, and, and, and I, I trip out like you know, we actually eat sandwiches of this stuff, and I'm like, man, how is that preserved? It's salt. But the Lord wants you to know, amen, that like if you leave what you get from God, if you leave it out, if you leave it out, and you don't appreciate it, guess what? It's going to become stale to you. I'm not saying the word of God is stale because the word of God is, 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 is efficacious. I love that word, efficacious. It's seed, meaning you can do whatever with it. When it's properly planted, it'll bring life, right? That's why when the word of God is properly planted in our hearts, it'll bring life. But the interesting thing, just getting back to the meat, right? When you take meat and, and, it is a, and salt is applied to it, so when your life is applied to the word of God, there's this preservation that takes place, which can feed people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when the word of God, when an epistle from God comes and it makes that connection to the people of God, there's something powerful that takes place. There's food. There's meat. There's bread. Jesus said, you guys have no idea. What, what, where I get my meat from? Jesus said, you have no idea. See, you guys are going to, to the corner store. You guys are going to Safeway. You guys are going to McDonald's, wherever you go. Amen. Jesus said, no, I don't need to go there because the meat that I get Amen. is to do the will of my Father. Amen. And the will of the Father is for you to hear the word. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to verse 2. Woo! You know, there's so much you could just pull from the word. I mean, it's like a thread, right? You ever have a thread that you pull on the sweater and it just keeps coming out? It just keeps coming. You're like, man, what is, man, what is this? Where is this going? Hold on. It just keeps coming, right? And, and it's the same thing with the word. Like, I could stay on one verse and I could preach all day because the spirit of God, amen, will keep continue to give you that thread. You got to <laughs> All right, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word again. 
There's, there's, there's their mention of Jesus again. Paul has mentioned in two verses, he has mentioned Jesus three times in Christ. Interesting. I, I look at this and I'm like, man, Paul, you are Jesus freak. Man, Paul, all you're talking about is Jesus. But verse 2 not only says, not only talks about in Christ, but it's also talking about what comes from him. Again, what comes from him. So in that letter, the content of that letter that you have received, the faithful in San Francisco, something is coming to you. And it is in the form of grace and peace. Grace and peace. Are you ready to hear grace and peace? Are you ready to receive grace and peace? Are you ready to open up that letter, the word of God that has been delivered to you, and stop looking to feel condemned? Stop looking, oh, how am I going to get right with God? How, oh, man, what do I need to do, God? A lot of us, man, I come from this type of culture in, in church. and Like, if, if you don't watch out, you're going to get so dependent on people pro prophesying to you. Because they're always looking to, God, what, what, God, speak to me. Uh, tell me what I need to do. Tell me what, what, where I need to go. And though there is some truth to that, I'm going to tell you this. If you hear the word of God, if you read the word, you're going to get everything you need. Amen. Amen. I've been to some prophetic conferences where they're prophesying. And I'm like, okay, God, when's my turn, God? When's my turn? The Lord will correct me and say, no, I ain't going to tell you anything. I, remember, I distinctly remember one day, I was at one of these conferences, and I'm praying, and I'm like, God, you know. And it's funny because people are going around prophesying to each other, and, you know, the preachers prophesying to people. And, and God tells me, no, I heard him. He said, open up your Bible. As soon as I open up my Bible, what I need to hear is right there in front of me. Like my eyes were focused. And it, has that ever happened to you? Yes. Have you ever done this? Like, God, oh, speak to me. And, and boom, right there. And, and see that because God is not looking for a method. Amen. He's looking just for you to understand that in any capacity that he speaks to you, there will be grace and peace delivered to you. So what is grace and peace? We hear these words all the time. We hear the word grace going around. I pastored a church that was called Word of Grace. But what does grace mean to you? Unmerited favor. Means you didn't deserve this. Divine enablement. Which means what you're about to do don't come from God. Charisma, amen? It means it's beautiful. You're going to like it. But this is what grace is. Grace is not just a term that we throw around. Grace is not a license to sin. Kim, it's not a license to sin. Amen? Grace is what God is going to give you that is the perfect gift. What does it say in James? It says every, perfect, every gift, every gift that you receive is perfect. Every gift, and it comes from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variance, no shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights. And so when you get this letter, you better, you best believe that you're going to hear something that's filled with grace. You, you know, I, I, I've, I've gotten gifts from people, and I'm like, you know, Sometimes I think, like, man, what am I going to do with this gift? Yeah. What am I going to do with this gift? Somebody will give you a gift card to a store you ain't never want, you ain't never been to, you never want to go to. You know, you ever got a gift card from, you know, from just think of the place where you've never, I got a gift card from Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm like, what am I going to do with this gift card? This some from my wife. You know, I'm like, this ain't for me. Maybe they're telling me that my bathroom look ugly and I need to upgrade my bathroom, right? But you ever get a gift that like is like, why did they give me this? One time somebody gave me a um, he gave me a um, this uh, this this apparatus, if you will. You put it in your mouth and it cleans your teeth. I forget what it's called. Water pit. Yeah, somebody gave me a water pit. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, is this brother telling me that I got bad breath? 
you know? My teeth, I mean, I know my teeth don't, you know, they don't look that good, but my teeth, yeah. they, you know, they need some help. But my wife is a dentist, or she works for a dentist, an oral surgeon. And so I've gotten surgery on my teeth. I've gotten implants, I've, you know, and, and I get this water pick and I'm like, oh, man. And it didn't bring peace. But, but see, God not only gives you a gift that's going to give you grace, but he's going to give you peace. When you look at that gift, when you look at the grace from God, God's going to give you peace. God gives you a husband. God gives you a wife. It's not just meant to be a beautiful thing, a beautiful person. But that individual, if it's from God, amen, will bring peace into your life. And, you'll, and, and peace is not just like, you know, you're, you're standing around, you're all bubbly, everybody's not having any problems. No, peace, it's a spiritual peace. It's the peace of God. Amen? See, there's peace from men. In other words, we're peace, peace, we're peace, at peace with the world. And then there's peace from God which you get like when you're going through something turbulent or you're having issues in your life and God just gives you the peace, the perfect peace, amen, that you pray for. Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. I'm praying to God and the, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so there's peace uh from God, but then there's a peace of God. There's a peace of God. So see, there's a peace that, that I get that can be uh, for the world, that can be for myself. But see, there exists this peace in heaven. If you just get a taste of that peace in heaven, amen, and, and think about peace as peace is not passive. Peace is not passive. As a matter of fact, I, I venture to go as far as to say that peace is in the kingdom. Remember, up and down. Got to go up and down. Got to receive. Got to give. The peace of the kingdom is actually warfare. That's going to blow your mind right there. Because everywhere that the peace of God goes, every part of the kingdom that the peace of God is extended to, Guess what? It changes the atmosphere. Demons flee, amen. Uh, the devil doesn't have no authority over it because you've conquered that territory, amen. You've taken it from the enemy. And the peace of God reigns. So it's war. It's conquered territory. That's why people's lives, uh, are, are something happens to them when they surrender their lives to God, amen. The peace of God, of God, is released into their hearts. And it's something that the enemy can't take away. The enemy will fight you. The enemy will want to reclaim you. Amen. But how many of y'all know that the peace of God, it, 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 it's war. It's warfare. And it's conquered territory. And God comes and he plants his flag in your heart and says, it's mine. Hallelujah. It's mine. So from that letter, when you open it up, you're going to get grace and peace. From God, our Father, <coughs> our Father, mm. our Father. When you hear a word of God, a lot of times we forget that it's come, somebody come, it's coming from somebody that sees us as his children. Mm. That's good. He sees you. As his children, which means that I mean, are you are you how many parents we got in here? Raise your hands if you're a parent. Amen. Two, three. See the thing, I couldn't I couldn't understand God's love for me. This was me, not you. But God revealed his love towards me when I had my children. Right? When I had my children. I understood God's love for me. And so I'm sitting there and oh, right before my kids are born, my, my daughter's born, I use my daughter as an example, right before my daughter is born, I get this call from a friend 
that I haven't talked to in years. Like literally, it's been years since I talked to this guy. He calls me up and he's like, hey, Eric, how you doing? Hey, man. Well, Eric, guess what, man? I just had a, pray for me. I just had a kid. And he died in crib death. And I'm like, he died? Yeah, you know, we left him alone and he just died. Sad. So I pray for him, but I realized though one thing that the devil was using that to pump fear into my heart, right? And so when my daughter was born, I'm like, uh uh, you ain't gonna be in the crib on your own. I'm gonna put you right there next to me and I'm gonna watch you. And and I remember she was in our bed and she was sleeping, and I'm up all night and I'm just watching her, her every breath. And I'm like, I, and then during this time I'm working. And so I'm like up all night watching her breathe in and out. And then, yes, there's fear. Amen. There's a fear. But something hit me at that point. I said, wow. I said, my love for this, this young infant is being expressed in me being up all night. How, how about God's heart towards me? The Bible says he doesn't sleep nor slumber. He watches me all night long, all morning long. He's right there watching me. See, this is the heart that God towards his children. God has towards his children. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't take a day off, amen. He ain't over here punching in and punching out, amen. See, that is, that is who God is. And so as children of God, you know what it means when you have a child? Do you know that it means that your DNA has been passed on to your children? Well, when the Spirit of God enters you, when you become saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have God's DNA. You have God's DNA. And, and not only that, but you have you, your ID, you, your identity changes. Oh, that's good right there. Your identity changes. And, and so the interesting thing about this passage in verse 2 is God is speaking to us about our identity. Our identity, amen? Being in Christ is the source of our identity. It's the source of who we are. The identity. I realize that through Jesus' death and resurrection, something has shifted. Something took place during Jesus' death death and resurrection. And now, the life of every believer, the life of everyone who has now had a shift in his identity, the life of everyone who has God's DNA inside of them now has shifted, and they have been repositioned. They have come out of the world and are now in Christ. Say, in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. I'm in Christ. My identity is in Christ. You know, this is the interesting thing about identity is that this is what the enemy is going to fight you for. You're not hearing me on that. See, the enemy is not really concerned about, honestly, the enemy is not really concerned about your, your finances. The enemy uses your finances to make you believe lies about who you are and whose you are. The enemy wants to use your family to make you forget who you are and whose you are, your identity. The enemy wants to use whatever he can use, problems at your job, to make you forget your identity. And when your identity is in Christ, amen, you, you, you remember every spiritual blessing that you have. Amen. You remember your position in Christ. See, again, I know what it is to deliver something, to reposition something. I used to take these packages, and I used to take them from point A to point B. I used to leave packages on people's doorsteps. I used to leave packages from, you know, in front of people's porches, in front of people's doors. But the most important thing about the work that I did was that I repositioned things. I took things from point A to point B. Amen? And, 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 and a lot of times, that package that I delivered was damaged. It had, it had uh, you shake it, you hear broken things. See, that's like us, right? We're broken inside. We're damaged from what we've been through. But when you have been repositioned in Christ, you go from point A. You go from your old life 
And now you've been delivered into your new life. You've been delivered to the doorstep of the kingdom. And now your identity changes because of who you are. You belong to the recipient, which is God, who will take you and heal you, who will take you and fix you, amen, who will take you from being damaged over into the place of his, um, his ownership where he fixes, he's a healer. Well, I remember I take one package, drop it off, and I'd be like, man, I feel bad for this person, but this is busted. And, I, you know, one individual, I'm like delivering it, and next day I see him, and he's like, man, that was beat up, but you delivered to me. But you know what? I fixed it. I fixed it. And, 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 and I don't need to return this thing. God doesn't return. But he, but when you give your heart to him, God will return you. You know? Oh, man, that's, that's good right there. <laughs> because of your identity in him. See, when you understand your identity through Jesus' death, and resurrection, now you have the power to reclaim your stolen identity. Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ has come to what? To give you life. And life more abundantly. Right? So, it's interesting because, right, probably one of the first things that you you happens to you when you come to Christ, because of your immaturity, you become more sin conscious than you become Christ conscious, right? So now I'm worried about sin. God, I don't want to sin no more, God, because I don't want to be like you, God. I want to live right for you, God. Um, God, I, I messed up, God. I'm so sorry, God. I, God, I don't have any bad thoughts, God. I can't, I can't stop thinking this way. I can't stop talking this way. You know, and there are things in your life that are going to change instantly. But, you know, how many of y'all know that mm, being healed or being fixed as that busted package is a process, right? You're not going to walk into the kingdom of God. You're not going to be saved, and all of a sudden you're perfect. But when you, when you come to God, he's gonna, there's going to be some time that's going to take place. I remember, man, when I had my encounter with Jesus, like the next day, I couldn't cuss. I got convicted every time I cuss. But there were still little dark areas in my mindset. Like there was still a lot of mistrust. There was still a lot of there was still a lot of like rebellion, you know, uh, problems with authority. Now God, you took away my 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 desire to cuss and other things about my life that just were gone. But yet there are still some things lingering in my life, right? But you know what God said? He said, "I'm not worried about." your behavior. Matter of fact, God went as far as to tell me I'm not worried about your sin. You know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about you understanding an in Christ lifestyle. I'm, I'm interested in you understanding your identity. I'm interested in you knowing that you have been repositioned. I'm interested in you. I could go on and on. But it's never it's never works focused. It's always will focused. It's always truth focused. Truth focused. God said, when you stop believing, when you start believing my word, my truth, and you stop believing lies, then that's how you're going to get your deliverance and your healing faster. But as long as you keep, keep mingling the truth with the lies, as long as you keep thinking, well, you know, I'm I'm cry, I'm saved, I'm I'm sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. But you know what? My my parents were were real. Uh, they, you know, my parents were real mistrusty. So I guess that's just the way I am, and that's a lie from the enemy. Because you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Old things have become new. Every curse has been cut off. Amen. You don't need to receive the generational curse that your parents have given, have passed on for generations and generations. A, a lot of these curses are just mindsets. They're not, see, that's, 
That's the important thing of understanding God's truth. Is the lie is that you have no choice over what is handed down to you generation to generation. But the truth says, no, these are mindsets that are not, I'm going to believe God's truth. I'm going to let go of these lies because these mindsets have been de- passed down from generation to generation, but they're cut off at this point, at this place, because I've been repositioned. Oh, that's good right there. I know of this lady, right? So uh, I know of her. I don't know her, but I know of her. So whenever she take a piece of ham, and she cooked the ham. She'll take the ham, and for some reason, she cut the tip off. And the husband was like, why did you do that? That's good meat. Why you cut the tip off? Uh-huh. Well, and then they went and asked the mom the same thing. And the mom said, well, because my mom always did it this way. And so then they went and asked the grandma, why do you do this? Well, in my village, you know, when I lived in my little town, the oven was yay big, so I had to cut the tip off and put the oven, put it in the oven. And so it's the same thing here, right? A lot of mindsets are handed down to us. A lot of mindsets, and, and, and because we, we don't realize that that doesn't apply to us anymore. God gave you, God gave you a bigger oven. Amen. You can cook that ham now without having to cut the tip off. Amen. Because God has given you something. He's repositioned you. He's changed you. And, and, and what I love about the power of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1.18. We're going to start going into, the, into other passages now. I think I've sat there for a while. 1 Corinthians 1.18. But the message of the cross is foolish with skills for perishing. It's as for being saved it is the power of God. Amen. The message of the cross. Christ's burial, death, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is what? It's power. It's power. Amen. Whenever you uh, you try to talk to your friends at work, you tell them about the, the you know the Jesus you serve, how he died and he was resurrected on the third day. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, that's foolishness to people. They don't understand. They don't have no concept. They believe lies for generations and generations. But, but see, the reality is that it's power to you. It's truth to you. Knowledge is power. Truth is power. Amen. I have, you know, what did Jesus say? The truth shall set you free. Right? So that's powerful. And so whenever you begin to understand, amen, the power of the cross, amen, you understand your identity. You understand that you have the power to reclaim your stolen identity. You understand that when God looks at you, he sees the perfection of Jesus, amen? He sees a saint in Christ. He sees you as a saint. He sees you perfect, blameless, holy. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. See, that's key. That's key to understanding your identity. Because the enemy always comes in with lies and tries to condemn you, tries to make you feel bad, tells you to give up, tells you to live according to the, the ways of the world, right? And that's the lie of the enemy. But, but when God sees you, he sees perfection. Because he ain't looking at you. He's looking at his son. You, you ever been to a party and you don't know anybody? And you're like feeling like, oh man, I don't know anybody at this party. Now I'm not going, you know, I'm not going to have a good time. But yet, because you know somebody, amen, it, it changes the dynamic of you crashing a party in a way where you know the person is connected, the person knows the person that's going to party real well. So you show up now all of a sudden because the people that have not recognized you, they recognize the individual that you're going in with. Guess what? You're accepted, you're welcome, you're received into the party. And God wants you to know that he don't invite you into his fellowship or into his kingdom based on you or who you know or what you know. But God has looked on the person, his special invited individual, amen? He's looked at his son and he said, hey, how you doing, Jesus? Who you bringing with you? Okay. 
Because I really like Jesus. <laughs> God is like, I really like Jesus. The father's like, and, and so, oh, you brought this person with you. And now you go from a place of feeling like a stranger to feeling like an invited person, right? Because they know who you know. Amen. That's how it is. But let me ask you this. How does, how does understanding this affect you personally? How does understanding that truth affect you personally? Anybody want to share? Amen. How does understanding the truth of when God looks at you, God looks at your identity, he sees his son. How does that, how does that affect you? Feel love. You understand the love. Huh? Accepted. You feel accepted, yes. You feel accepted. You feel confident. How many of us, how many more of us need confidence? How many more of us need uh, to feel accepted? I, see, I've been there. Amen. I've been there. A lot of times you fight, you fight with uh, knowing who you are, and you fall into this uh, this cycle of performance. And now, because I messed up, now I, I got to go and make up for that. You know that that's kind of like a that's a religious thing, because religion says you got to do everything you can to make it into heaven. That's religion. Be good, and you'll make it into heaven. Be bad and you'll go to hell. But how many know Christianity? Remember, down up. Remember, receive, give. So in Christianity is different. In Christianity, you come to the end of your performance. You come to the end of works. You come to the end of, 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 of feeling like uh, you got to earn. Amen? Because down is up in the kingdom. So this, I don't understand this concept. But this is who God is, right? God wants a relationship. I know it's cliche. God wants a relationship, not religion. But it's such deep truth to that. If you were to grab hold of that, the relational aspect, you could be, you could be like God. You could, you could understand why you will not look on your children's uh, uh, imperfections or misbehaviors. Because you say to yourself, well, that's my son. Oh, I know he's I know he's a little bit out there, but my son, that's my son. Don't talk about my son. Right? That's who Jesus is. That's who the father is. Amen. Don't talk, don't talk about my children. Yeah, man, somewhere in man, like man, look, the kids are out of control, man. I don't know if you guys have had that here, but I've been to some churches where the kids are out of control and they're running in the aisles and they just, you know, they did just yeah, crying or running or, you know, we, we have that, unfortunately, we have that in some churches where they don't understand the, the, you know, the concept of order, right? And so they'll let their kids run. I was at one church and the kids literally ran up on stage and they're like doing this, dancing while the, mute, while the worship music is going on. And I'm like, man, that's such a distraction. But you know what the parents are thinking? The parents, are, you know, the parents, are, that never happened to me, but the parents are probably thinking like, that's my kid. Go, exactly. <laughs> cool, Jimmy, go, exactly. And because of that, when God sees you, he sees his DNA in you. He'll be up all night watching you because you're his. Let's go back to Ephesians 1. We're going to go to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he say God and Father? I always wondered that. Why not just say Father? I always wondered this. I was like, God, you know, it, it was in relation to us. Because he's our God and he's our Father. And so he wanted that, he wanted you to understand that in Christ, he's your God and he's your father. A lot of people, a lot of Christians walk into, a lot of Christians walk into church and haven't known God as their father. They just know God is God. He's up there, I'm down here, right? I'm doing my thing, and, and you know, he's a big old, 
uh, uh, being uh, sitting on his throne and he's watching me and you know they don't understand the concept of father what does a father do a father provides a father protects right and so and so now I'm understanding that like there's this like dual thing that we have with God yes he's our God but yes he loves us so much that he'll love us as a father and he did this with Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. He said, Behold my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what he that's what God, the you the Father, uh, the God, the God of the universe, the supreme authority, the supreme being, that's what he has said in relation to you, because he is not only your God, but he's your father. So I I I, I always I always ask that. Who has blessed us? Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I go to Paul mentioning Jesus Christ again, man. Paul, we get it. And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, Paul. You don't mention Jesus in every verse. Come on, Paul. Are you serious? All right. Blessed be God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in in Christ. There we go again. There we go again. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I like that part where it's talking about every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's like, I don't really, it's such a huge term. Every spiritual blessing that sometimes we can look at something and just like we look at God, right? We can see the term every spiritual blessing and not really understand how it relates to me, right? So God, you're God, but how does that relate to me? How does that filter down to me? How can I, how can I, uh, how can I embrace that concept of, of, of God? Well, he said, I'm your father. So how can I embrace the concept of every spiritual blessing belonging to me? Now think about that. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is your possession. Amen? It means that Jesus is yours. Jesus, bounty is your possession. I love that word bounty. I think of bounty hunter. A bounty hunter goes out and he hunts something. He chases it down and he brings it in and he's offered a reward. So the bounty is the reward for something that you went out and you did or you got, right? And so, so it's kind of like, it's, it's the same thing. It's like Jesus went out and he did what he did. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. Amen. He, um, he did everything he did. He defeated Satan. He, 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 uh, he shared with us his truth. His truth set us free. He went out and he did the work. And the reward of that work now comes to me because I received Jesus' bounty. I, re I received from Jesus' work. And it's the same thing with you. You didn't do nothing to earn. You didn't do nothing to go and work for what you, you know, you get in every spiritual blessing, but somebody gave it to you. Because it's his bounty. Now, now, now let's let's look at what does it look like to for you to picture every spiritual blessing in heaven as your possession. Think about that. What does it look like? And, and how does it make you feel? Think about that. Think about that as applied to your life. Thank you, Lord. So, we already talked about this. The, the blessing that has come to us from the bounty, the blessing of position, we talked about that. You've been repositioned. Go to Acts 2.17. What has happened in Acts 217? Acts 
Acts 2.17. Acts 2.17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your, your old men shall go sorry. Your old men shall That's yes, that's it. Thank you. So God is saying here that um, he's given you the blessing of position. Amen. So you have gone from uh, being a, a son and a daughter, right? You've come, you've gone from being a son and a daughter to somebody who can who can prophesy, who can preach, right? You've gone from being an old man to someone now who who, who dreams, right? Uh oh man, I'm, this is my life, this is my lot in life, I'm old. Man, that's it. I, I, I didn't achieve my dreams. No, God is repositioning that mindset and he's saying, yes, you're old, but now you can still dream. Because we always attribute dreams of being for kids, right? Right? And, and, and your young men shall see visions. Why? Because I poured out my spirit on all flesh. So our bounty is God's, God's spirit. Amen. So he changes our position. We talked about that. And he gives us of his provision. He provides. Go to Matthew 6 8. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things he has need of before you ask him. Amen. Amen. So he's giving you the promise of provision, even to the point where you don't even need to ask him. Think about that, right? Like, like that being a bounty of God is like it blows my mind. It takes away a lot of anxiety from my, what I'm constantly thinking of. How many of y'all always thinking of man? I'm, I, it, I fall victim to it because I'm paying this mortgage. That's you know it's it's really like I'm looking at it like man, God, I'm gonna make it next month. But He knows, He knows, and He's always been faithful. He's always come through. Amen. He knows what your needs are before you even ask Him. So it doesn't go by how much you pray. You know, God wants you to pray. If I pray harder, God's going to give it to me. No. No, because he knows what you need. He knows that you need. Just ask. You know what I did with God a couple times? And in my, in my heart, I was like, man, I need to pray. I need to pray at least two weeks. I need to fast. Man, fasting is really hard for me, but I need to fast. I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to jump through every hoop that I know that the Bible has to say. I'm going to do it because I really need this thing. I really need this provision from God. And you know what the Spirit of God told me? You know what? Eric? Chill. Yeah, chill. He said, just ask and watch. As a matter of fact, don't worry about asking a hundred times. Just verbalize what you need. Verbalize what you need. He already knows what I need. Just verbalize. Just ask me. So I said, "Why?" Well, and this peace came on me. And I said, "God, can you please help me with, with whatever?" And it brought this peace in me. And I was like, "Wow, that's really all it took. It took me aligning my will with His. It took me understanding my identity, taking that truth and embracing that truth. It took me realizing that when I talk to my son." About, you know, about, um, you know, when I talk to my son, that literally, like, he don't need to ask me for food because it's there. He don't need to ask me for shelter because it's there. It's a given, right? How many of us have fallen into that trap? God, I need this. God, help. And this anxiety and all of this. But God said, I've given you peace. He, there's no reason for you to fall into this, like, lie. That something has changed. You're still my child. You're still my son. And so sometimes I got to tell my son, calm down, man. You're eating all the Captain Crunch. Calm down. <laughs> 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 Save me, son. <laughs> so God gives you position. He gives you provision. And he gives you protection. Three Ps you need to walk away with today. I'm almost done. God gives you his position. There's a blessing in position. There's a blessing in provision. And he gives you his protection. Go to John 10, 11. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Mm. 
God's protection. He wants you to understand that the same way this, this shepherd, this good shepherd, you know what a shepherd is? Like literally, like the, the, the Jews were hated for being shepherds, right? Because what, what do shepherds do? Like literally, they, they, they're around animals all day. So if God is around you, you might stink like an animal, but he's around you. And because animals stink, guess what? The shepherd stinks. And because animal, you know, animals go astray, the shepherd's constantly working. Like that kind of job, you're, you're constantly watching. You're constantly working if you need to because animals are dumb. Sheep are dumb. Like sheep, right? They're the dumbest. Right? But this particular shepherd is not a hireling. The good shepherd is somebody that will lay his life down. Think about that. What kind of things does does a shepherd face? What kind of dangers does he go through? Huh? Predators. Lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. But that, that's literally what most shepherds will do is they'll look at that tiger, lion, or bear and they'll be like, I'm out. I'm out. You know? You ever watch these videos? I mean, sometimes I watch these videos, the world's dumbest criminals. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? And, and a, a criminal will like, you know, because criminals, you know, not a lot of them are bright, but like literally they're, he, they'll, they'll see something and they just run out of there, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's so funny sometimes, like, you know, like they'll see like, a, you know, they'll hear an alarm go off and they're gone. You know what I'm saying? They'll see their reflection in the mirror and they're gone, right? Yeah. Because because that's what happens with a lot of shepherds. And I know a lot of shepherds that are hiring this. Because you look at pastors. Some pastors have no covenant with the sheep or with the congregation. And as soon as that paycheck diminishes or as soon as that paycheck uh, runs out, guess what? They're gone. Because that's exactly how shepherds are, but we're talking about a good shepherd. And what does a good shepherd do? The Bible says that he is committed to the sheep, even to the point of laying down his life. See, when you have a pastor, a minister that lays down his life for you, you need to honor that. Like literally, like when I look at Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me sharing this, he won't receive no salary. Matter of fact, he's bivocational. He has to work. And that's no nothing bad on you guys. But I'm saying this man has laid his life down for the ministry. I've even told him, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, but I've even told him, I said, bro, I said, are you sure maybe you don't want to start a Bible study at home group and just kind of like the church, kind of like just, you know, because brother, it, it, that's tough what you're doing. And I know what he's gone through because when I was pastoring, I went through the same thing. I had to be by vocation. But you know what? God honors that. And I'm going to tell you, if God honors it, you need to honor it. And you need to honor the things that he says. And you need to honor, the Bible says that elder is worthy of double honor. Well, you need to be honoring that man of God. And honor is not just like this, this terminology of like, oh, yeah, when I see you, I honor you. You know, I recognize you. No, honor him. Uh, so in his life. Amen. Like when you see him, literally, like tell him, Pastor, I really appreciate what you're doing. And I know you've laid down your life for me because you have the heart of the good shepherd. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So God's giving you this protection. What time is it? How am I doing on time? 11.37. What time are you guys done here? 12. I go to 10. All right, all right, all right. What does it look like? So I want you guys to know, what does it look like to picture every spiritual blessing in heaven as your possession? How does that feel? How does that feel? Amen. Let's look at the third point here, and I'm going to wrap it up after this. Um, Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us. I spoke about that too. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless before him. 
Hallelujah. That is good. Uh, you know, being holy and blameless is it's, it's a process, but it's a truth in my life. As a matter of fact, can you understand the concept of you're holy and blameless, but you're also becoming holy, holy and blameless? Yes. You, you know why? Because you're still getting the revelation of your identity. Really, the holy and blameless part has already taken place. It's in my spirit. Right? That I'm already, so in my in my in, in my body I have world consciousness. In my soul, I have self-consciousness, but in my spirit, I have God consciousness. So in my spirit, I am holy and blameless. What is taking place? It's it, my body's gonna die. My God, the world is going to be destroyed. So where is the battleground? Where am I becoming holy? Where does it mean to be justified and sanctified? What's the difference? So I'm justified and sanctified at the same time. There's a soul thing. There's a mind thing that's taking place. And God is renewing my mind. That's where the battle is. The battle's in the mind. The battle's in your soul. Because in your soul, you have three things, mind, will, and emotions. So God is healing your mind. God is repositioning your will. Right? God is changing my mind. He's repositioning my will and he's healing my emotions. And that, that's, that's where it's taking place. That's the place really that God is concerned in your life. God's not concerned about the interiors or what's taking place outside, but God is concerned with what's taking place inside. God is, God is releasing his shalom. He's releasing from the place of his spirit, from the place of your every spiritual blessing aspect. He is releasing his spirit over your soul, which means that that's because that's where the battleground is. That's where the enemy comes with his lies and tries to steal your identity. That's where the enemy comes, and there's this battle, this back and forth that takes place, right? You're betwixt and between this like place of understanding God's kingdom. But God is releasing his peace over your soul because peace is war, because peace is a battle. And the more you allow his peace to be revealed in your life, the more you'll understand who you are and whose you are. Hallelujah. And what are you? You're holy and blameless again. Praise my hand that. That's a truth hanging over my life. If that's a truth hanging over my life, then what's the problem? What's the problem? It's in my belief system, right? But when I read the scriptures and I see that that scripture, which which shows God saying, "Be ye holy, because I am holy." The mindset for a lot of y'all is, "Ooh, I gotta perform to be holy." Be ye holy, because I am holy. No, God is not telling you to be holy. God is making a declaration over your life. He's saying, be holy. I am holy. He's made that declaration over your life. God's not asking you to be holy. God is declaring it over your life that you are holy and blameless in him. Amen? So in Christ, we have as our identity holiness and blamelessness. How do you feel as being a brand new temple of God, as being the brand new temple of God? How does that feel? How does that feel? How does it feel to know that my identity is in Christ? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. How, how, does, how does this truth impact my inner world inside? How does these truths all over the scriptures, when, when I read, uh, uh, he's given me every spiritual blessing, when I read that God chose me for himself to set me apart for his purpose, made me blameless in Christ, how does that change my soul? How does it impact me? And that really is the question. That really is the question. That's something that needs to be activated inside of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. So I'm going to close with this. For everything that you read, amen. Got four, four, four verses. Amen. Amen. 
Sometimes we try to earn holiness by our efforts and hard work. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you the difference between trying to be a saint and simply living from the reality of holiness. It's a reality. Ask the Holy Spirit to highlight to you one area in your life where holiness is already evident in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit to highlight. So, so let's close our eyes. And I want you to do like this, this like internal, um, uh, you know how the Bible says to examine yourself in the world? Let's do this, this internal examination and, and understand your faults. Like look at your flaws, look at your faults. And now I want you to picture the places that you conquer, the places that you feel strong in, and the places that you feel weakened. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God, you know, Lord God, that I, I'm conquered in these areas. I struggle in these areas, God. Now, in your mind, I want you to see what it looks like for you to walk in the holiness that the Word of God speaks of. What does it look like? Not just getting rid of sin. But what does it look like to have victory in that area in your life? What does it look like? Are you ready for this? Before you're done. That's who you are. That's what you are. Now. That's what you are now. So let that light, let the peace of God you know where the Bible says the peace of God which surpasses all understanding means is get your mind out of the way and just receive this truth. Because the truth of God is not meant to be comprehended. The truths of God are meant to be apprehended. Get your mind, get that filter out of the way and receive this truth. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your revelation, because this is what it's all about, Lord. It's revelation. And, Lord, we understand that the word revelation, Lord, is an uncovering. Hallelujah. It's an uncovering of something that we can see. Right now, Lord, there are things in our lives, God, which are covered. And that cover is dirty. That cover is filthy, as a matter of fact. It's a filthy rag, Lord God, and it's covering who we truly are. So, Father, we declare, God, in our mind's eye, God, that that covering be released, that covering be removed, Lord, that we can see who we are. We can see our identity in you, Lord, that we can see, Father God, your truth about what we really are, who we really are, God. We thank you, God. That the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, that covering is removed. And you're revealing to us who we are right now. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, we bless you, we magnify you, we exalt you. And Lord God, we give ourselves to you and to your truth in Jesus' name. Everybody says? Amen. 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 This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.